Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our last installation of the Summer Brown Bag Series, sponsored by the Department of Psychiatry. We welcome you today and um, to hear a presentation from our Deaf Wellness Center. But before we give them the podium and the floor, I'd just like to cover a few housekeeping items. Um, so as always, we want to invite you to participate in any snacks and refreshments over on the side. And if, um, feel free to walk down throughout the presentation. Um, if not, that's okay. <laughs> uh, we also will have an attendance sheet rounding the presentation. We ask that you fill out that presentation sheet so that we're able to monitor our numbers. Um, I wanted to just take a moment to thank our fantastic tech team for all the work that they've done this summer. And I'm going to call them out by names and anyone that helped with them. So Brian Chang, who is actually leading our endeavors, he's actually sitting right up here in the front. And he's been so instrumental along with Carrie Heinemann, who is, you can't see her, but she's up in the booth. And Amanda Lai, who is sitting in the back, she's gonna start the attendance sheet going around. I don't know where we would be this summer without the team. So I just wanted to take a moment to thank them and um, go ahead, give them a round of applause. That would be fantastic. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So no further ado, I know that we were going to sit, um, if you can, if you wanna sit closer, just so that you're able to see the interpreters and, um, but if you feel fine sitting in the back, feel free. And with that, I'm going to hand things over to our Deaf Wellness Center to begin our panel discussion. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Eileen, Eileen Alder, and I am a clinical psychologist within the Deaf Wellness Center. I came here at U of R in 2019 for my psych internship. I did two years of research and then came back with the Deaf Wellness Center department in 2022. So I do part-time clinical work and part-time research. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sharon Haynes. I'm a social worker here, and I started working here in 1998 for an internship and then back to work at the Deaf Wellness Center around 2002. And I've been working here for 19 years now, and I work primarily with deaf patients and mental health counseling services. Great to be here. Hello, my name is Donna Guardino. I'm a clinical psychologist here as well, and I did my internship here in 2016. I graduated and did some work at the National Center for Deaf Health Research for a little while, and then I came here to the Deaf Wellness Center doing clinical work, some education, and also teaching some fellows. Okay, so today we are going to be talking about how to navigate cultural conflicts between deaf employees and hearing employees and what that might look like. Um, and also how to make a more um, psychologically safe environment for everybody. This presentation, I am going to put each slide up and I will be quiet for a moment while you guys can read it. That's part of Deaf Culture um, is pausing so that you can read the slides before we present on them. So I will go ahead and do that pause now so you can read. Some of you might be confused why I've got this slide up here. The interpreting process is not perfect. Uh, sometimes uh, the interpreters today did not have any prep before this presentation, so they've never seen it before. So this is the first time that they're seeing us present it. There may be some errors in the interpreting process. So I just wanted to put that disclaimer in before we start. And to add to that, sometimes um, as we're presenting, we're working with the interpreters. So if there's something that comes up that's not clear, we'll clarify, or the interpreters will clarify with us before moving on to, just so you know. Okay, so our goals for today, we are going to do a little bit of deaf culture and part of our history. 
um, education, what our values are, what our cultural experiences look like, just to give you guys a taste of what deaf culture looks like. After that, we will talk about deaf individuals in hearing environments. So deaf culture is talking about how deaf folks interact with other deaf folks, um, but we will talk about how our culture shifts when we are working in hearing environments. We'll talk about discrimination, cultural conflicts, microaggressions, et cetera, and what those look like in the workplace with the goal of fixing that, how to um, foster safe environments for everyone. This presentation is not meant to criticize anyone. We also will acknowledge a lot of departments are already doing a lot of things to create more safe spaces for us as deaf folks. Um, but we welcome you to ask questions. Um, we'll answer any questions that you have. This is a safe place. We do want you to feel like if you have questions or anything, then you can ask them here um, and we will answer them as best as possible. So really, we only have an hour for this presentation. It's going to be really difficult to encompass the entire deaf experience in that process. And we just want to give you as a bit of an overview. The deaf community often uses in incidental learning. Incidental learning means unintentional learning. So that is learning that you receive through podcasts or the radio auditory input that you're receiving every day. Those are things you don't even realize that you are learning and that knowledge accumulates over time. Whereas for a deaf person, you are removing and it's almost as if anything above a third grade reading level is removed because there's not that access to the podcast, to the radio. Uh, even family conversations happening around a dinner table or going to a doctor's appointment and hearing information in that environment, that is all removed. And YouTube has captions, but if you ever watch them, you can see that information gets lost. So when you take all of this extra information that hearing people are having access to, and look at the deaf experience, you can see that access is much more limited. And often there are hearing people will, who, who will assume, well, deaf people have deaf parents, and so they have access to that information, but the actual statistics are that 96% of, of deaf children have hearing parents, and often only 13% of parents will sign with their children. So parents who actually, and the, of that 13%, not all are fluent in sign language. So some may only be finger spelling words to their children, not providing full access to the language. So they aren't fluent enough to have in-depth conversations. And so that 13% is actually quite smaller. And that gives you an idea of what access looks like for deaf children. Then when you think about the educational system, there are deaf children who are being mainstreamed, which means that they are in a hearing classroom with other hearing children and they may be the only deaf child in the class or there may be a few deaf children in a specific grade or in a specific school and the school decides what accommodations to provide. Some may not provide an interpreter at all and the deaf student is trying to lip read and figure out what is going on. Some will provide an interpreter specifically only for classes, but not for lunch activities or recess or any social opportunities. So it, taking all that into consideration, their opportunities for learning are much more limited. It impacts development, it impacts learning. And I just want to give you that foundation as you're listening to this presentation. And we all want to give you a little taste of our own backgrounds of what our upbringings looked like. For myself, my whole family is deaf. So my parents uh, actually attended an oral school, which means that they were with other deaf students, but signing was not allowed in the school. Instruction was all in voice. And so they did not have access 
to all of the information because only 30% of words are legible on the mouth. So lip reading is very ineffective. Later, they learned sign language. And then myself and my brother were both deaf. And so luckily, we were able to have full access to language growing up and went to a deaf school. For me and my experience growing up, I was born um, at, at hearing and became deaf at two due to spinal meningitis and a near death experience. And the outcome of that is I lost my hearing. And at two and a half years old, I went to a school uh, called Walnut School in Lansing, Michigan, where that focuses on using your voice, not any sign language. And I really, really struggled in that environment. It's so frustrating to try to get access and teachers would actually penalize students for using their hands to communicate. So living or growing up in that environment with hearing parents, not having access to sign language, we would gesture sometimes like you'd go imagine going to the grocery store. And it's the communication is so basic, like you don't know what's going on around you and trying to maybe get by with just basic uh, manual communication really was very limited. And it wasn't until I was nine that I got to access a deaf school where there were other kids who signed and teachers that signed and I had direct access. And at that point, I was involved in a deaf school and my parents started learning sign language at 14. And I was finally able to make those connections to what they were trying to say, what people are saying with their voice and how information is communicated through sign language. So that language and that deprivation of language that I had growing up was such a limiting factor. And my sister, fortunately, would be the one to try to help translate or fill in those gaps for me. I was uh, identified as deaf or hard of hearing really when I was seven years old. Um, the funny story is that my mom uh, actually was diagnosed as hard of hearing at the same time. <laughs> um, we both decided to get hearing aids. So I had hearing aids that I used while I was in school. My parents are immigrants. They're from another country. So they didn't quite understand the American school system and how to advocate for my needs. The doctor just gave me hearing aids and sent me on my way. So that was the only kind of accommodations that I had. I never had interpreters. I never learned sign language um, all throughout school. And then when I was 20, at random, I took an ASL class. I thought it would be fun. And I was like, oh my goodness, there's a whole deaf community. There are deaf schools, there's deaf culture. And I then transferred to a deaf university um, and became part of the deaf community at that point in time. So I never socialized with any other deaf people growing up and I never knew sign language until that point. So we are an example of the variety of experiences you'll see in the deaf community. And that's why we wanted to share our backgrounds to give you an understanding of um, what that looks like. Again, I think it would take more than this one hour to clearly and efficiently explain deaf history, but we can say that um, there is reference to deaf people going back to Aristotle, who says that deaf people were incapable of being educated. And as history went on, as you can see from this slide, it wasn't, um, it was around the late 1700s or the 1800s when some hearing people set up some deaf schools and we started to see deaf teachers. But then around the late 1800s, people began immigrating and moving and there was some fear that they didn't want people to speak languages other than English. And so there was a big push for English to be the primary language that is also around the same time as the eugenics movement. And sorry, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> and Alexander Graham Bell during this time, sorry, I completely lost his name there for a moment. 
And it's impossible to not know his name when you're learning about deaf history. But he was involved in the eugenics movement and did not want deaf people to be able to marry other deaf people, did not want you to be able to learn sign language, wanted really to push for that oral education that we mentioned before. And it was a really sad time for deaf history because before that we had seen some progress and all of that was removed and the focus became on speaking. And then there, in 1880, there was the Congress of Milan where educators met to discuss how best to teach deaf children. And at that time, it, it was decided that signing would be um, not allowed and schools began to all switch to oral education and that meant students access to education became much more limited. It wasn't until the 1960s that American Sign Language officially became recognized as a language. That was in the 1960s, which is around the same time as the civil rights movement was happening. And racial segregation in schools was being outlawed and voting rights were being expanded. So really around the same time that America it was gaining more rights for everyone, the deaf community was just beginning with being recognized as having a full language that was their own and not feeling embarrassed to sign in public, uh, not feeling that they identify only with having a disability, but can embrace that cultural aspect. And uh, 1988, the, the only deaf university we have is Gallaudet University in Washington, DC. And we also now have NTID at RIT. But in 1988, they were looking for a new president and they were going to put a hearing president as in charge of this deaf university. It caused a big outrage, lots of protests because deaf students wanted to see a deaf president of their university. And it really became a shift in showing what is important to the community and continuing to improve what is provided and expected in the community. So talking about the deaf experience and how limited information can be, uh, that goes hand in hand when we think about our values. Our values are communication access because so many people experience those barriers and not having transparent information, transparent communication. Often hearing people can find information in a variety of ways and it's more difficult for a deaf person and they want that clear, focused information. And like I mentioned, the learning opportunities can be limited and so education and sharing information is very important within the community as well. The deaf community is a collectivist community. We obviously will be doing our own things, but if one person realizes that there is an experience of oppression or language deprivation, the community really does work together to try and overcome that and support each other through the process. Deaf culture also values American Sign Language as the primary language of deaf people in the United States. I want to add as well, um, Donna mentioned information sharing. Sometimes it conflicts with the hearing world. It looks sometimes like deaf people are oversharing and uh, talking about inappropriate things in public. Um, but for us, it's normal. And it might look like gossip, but it's not gossip. It's just sharing what we know. Um, you guys might read about um, or, or listen to podcasts about sensitive topics, but maybe we didn't have access to that information because it was only auditory. So sometimes it's a little bit conflicting um, our uh, very open information sharing versus hearing culture. So to give you a little bit more information about deaf culture, <clears throat> we have over a million users of sign language across the United States. And when we think about the number of, of that, that's a lot of people. And deaf people, it's not just um, a, 
a group that's localized to your community. We're really connected across our nation. So like uh, Eileen and Donna mentioned about being a collectivist community, we value making those connections and maintaining those connections across different states even. So when we think about the sharing of information and the sharing of values, like let's say, if to give you an example, like let's say in regional dialects, like you might say soda in one part of the country or pop in another country. Well, you can still work together and understand meaning the uniqueness of American Sign Language follows those similar trends with regional variations. And the same is true in, in another example, like we talked about the variety of backgrounds with different schools and schools being a really important part of our identity. And if you had access to sign language or if you didn't, our experiences span across a wide range of experiences. And we don't necessarily view them as right or wrong, but we embrace that and bring those cultural language differences all together in one. And I think it's so important that we tailor our connections based on individual needs. And when we think about the deaf community, we had what a, a central hub, what we call the deaf um, deaf club that would often be part of the local community. And we value that because if you imagine being a deaf person navigating your community, your workplace, maybe the school, oftentimes you're probably the only deaf person in your area. Well, when you can gather with other deaf people, whether it's around sports or a club, a social gathering, like for example, in Rochester, we had a deaf bowling league that um, was really tight knit and we would play against other deaf bowling leagues from Michigan or from other states and it actually strengthens the connections that we had to the community, not just in Rochester and over time deaf clubs. Um, were impacted about like the numbers of people that attend and we see currently deaf clubs um, get smaller or even closed, but Rochester's deaf club still exists. Like there's still some communities with larger deaf populations where deaf clubs exist and they're considered a central part of their community. And we have <clears throat> national organizations like the National Association for the Deaf, where that unifies um, local organizations or state organizations for deafness together on a national level. We also have the National Black Deaf Advocates Group, which ties together regional um, organizations to a national movement, whether that's promoting uh, better access to education or social opportunities. There's uniqueness like that in our community. We have our own art and humor and poetry and even storytelling where we value the, the sharing of our arts through our language. And when we think about, you know, comedy in the hearing community, like there are so many times deaf individuals don't understand hearing humor and vice versa. And that's okay, we embrace the uniqueness of our communities, but we get access to that through our language and community. Like sometimes, you know, hearing people are laughing uh, at something and we're like, we didn't find that funny. And then vice versa, hearing people are in the deaf space and they're not, laughing over something that's hilarious in our community, but we definitely embrace those values and those differences. So, Another unique part of the deaf community in terms of family life, um, to give you some more context, like growing up in my experience with hearing family members, being at home with my family, especially around the dinner table, was really isolating. My sister, she got access to what was going on. She would talk about what's happening in school or what would happen to extended family and, and all the latest news of what was going on. I didn't have access to that. That information gap occurred in my life that wasn't there for my sister because she had access to that. So they often say deaf individuals with deaf family members often have that access 
to more of what's going on in their lives, in the world. And when I was growing up and would go to dinner or go, go hang out with my friends that had deaf parents, the experience was night and day difference between what I had with my parents. The amount of information that's shared is so superficial. Like maybe it would be, how are you? How's the food? It's time for bed. What was that? What was, what was being said with that? Oh, I'll tell you later. That, that's the extent of conversation between me and my family members. You know, you, you, I would see my mom chatting with my sister saying, they're talking for five minutes. Hey, mom, what are, what are you talking about? Oh, they were talking about golf. How, what, where are all the details? What, what was happening that allowed you to carry that conversation on for so long? If you had direct communication access, your experiences might be completely different. So for me, again, like I mentioned, often being isolated and my parents are now deceased. And I remember before while my parents were alive, they would, they would gesture and say, you know, when I was telling my mom, when, when you die, I feel like I'm going to be left out from my family and my sister. I feel like my sisters are going to talk to me. And my mom was like, no, no, that's, that's not going to happen. But sure enough, after my uh, parents passed away, the separation was more extreme in my family where we'd only talk over the holidays, Merry Christmas, or how are you doing? You know, that's, it's a very common experience among other deaf individuals with their family when there are communication barriers. And so when I think about my family, my chosen family are based on the friends that I have, the people that I have direct communication access to, people that I've built a relationship with. So oftentimes you will have friendships that are actually part of your family. When I think about holidays or thinking about the close knit can, individuals that I connect with, it's often my friends over the family, not because I wanted that, but because of the barriers that existed. And when I think about individuals, you know, from different um, cultures, or you think about when, if you are getting family values or even religious values or other belief systems that are passed on from generation to generation, oftentimes for deaf people, we are learning from our peers, those uh, around us, not from those before us. So, I, I, and that could be different for deaf individuals with deaf family members. That actually allows for more of the um, traditions or beliefs to be passed on, you know, down through the generation. And another topic, the exposure to sign language is important. Yeah, it totally varies when people learn sign language. Donna learned sign language from birth. I didn't learn sign language until I was 20. And you I, often see that in a uh, variety in the deaf community. That's right. And I learned sign language at nine. And, you know, some um, who became deaf a little later in life, their experiences are completely different, you know. And the amount of times we're judged on our ability to use our voice um, is, is really high. But it often depends on every individual's experience. And also, deaf people's identities are a very unique experience. Often when you're born, you know your identity, you know your religion. Um, you're still kind of in the process of developing your identity, but it's based on your family, perhaps. But for me, I didn't develop my deaf identity until I was 20, so different than other cultures. And another interesting thought like to share, when I went into a deaf school at nine years old and I met other deaf peers, especially ones that had deaf family members, you could quickly identify that they come from a deaf family. And people would say, I know your parents are hearing. Or, are, you, are you even deaf? And I'm, and I'm thinking, what defining factors do I give off that allow people to identify that I don't have deaf family members. And it's the way I express myself, the way I act. Some people would say, there's a, maybe a term that you're familiar with, what we call um, someone who really embraces deaf culture as part of their identity. We would capitalize 
the word deaf as opposed to having it a lowercase, just I'm deaf as like a diagnosis. So having that cultural deaf identity is something you're proud of and we tend to capitalize that. But someone who's developing that identity, that journey um, is a struggle for individuals. And it, that, it, that ability of acceptance looks different for each person. And for the interest of time, I'll <clears throat> skim through these other few bits in this slide. But the <clears throat> educational experience really varies among individuals and their ability to get access, whether through an interpreter or if they didn't have an interpreter, all of that contributes to how they function and feel in within the community. And there's such a variety. Um, you know, I think what we also know for those that depend on auditory access or the residual hearing that they have, they might use a cochlear implant, their FM system, you know, something that gives them amplified audio access. So that works for some people, but doesn't work for others. So when we think about now getting into the diversity within the deaf community, there are black deaf individuals and Muslim deaf individuals and the uniqueness extends even further then. So in this, for the audience here today, uh, just to share uh, some other additional cultural experiences, when we think about two deaf people having a conversation and sometimes just the way we're positioned, someone might walk by. For those that might know or maybe even done yourself, some people try to duck under this invisible space where people are having the conversation and try to like crouch down and you know, they think they're obstructing their, their field of view, but really that's not um, inappropriate. You can just walk by. The title of this slide is Deaf Bing, um, and that's kind of our slang for explaining um, what is typical behavior. Like a, a deaf bing is like a deaf tendency, a deaf cultural tendency. So um, you'll notice that a lot of these deaf tendencies are in conflict with hearing tendencies. So it would be offensive for you to walk through the middle of a hearing conversation, but it's more distracting to not just walk straight through. So, you know, if hear two hearing people are in the hall, I might just walk right through and that is considered rude. But for us, you should do that. Just walk right through a conversation. Some deaf people follow deaf cultural behaviors. Some people follow hearing cultural behaviors. So just a little bit conflicting and, sometimes. And of course, we often accommodate to, to other hearing people. We will walk around someone to be polite and not do something that we're typically used to doing. And we're often very blunt. Like, it's normal. We'll speak our mind. You know, if someone's you know, if someone doesn't look great today, we'll say, you don't look great. And then other people, like hearing people might say, they look fine. Or, well, it's animated in this little film too that you guys can see later. But banging on tables to get attention, you know, that might be so disruptive to hearing people. Oh, that, they're loud, they got some personality issues. But ways to get attention look different when you're not relying on sound. Um, telling stories look very different uh, in the deaf community than how you would tell a story um, in hearing culture. Um, we have what's called deaf standard time where our time with other deaf people usually gets so extended beyond typical times. Like when we think about, um, for example, I gotta leave at five, you know, it's time to go, but I'm around other deaf people you can bet that I'll, by the time I actually leave, it's around six o'clock. That extra time um, is there. Okay, we're gonna show the videos now, please, Brian. So we've got three different videos that are funny examples of what deaf culture tends to look like. There is no sound on them, but they're just funny, uh, funny little clips for you.
This is the GMC Sierra. So that last example at the end, it was like, oh, you don't know who I'm talking about? Oh, that's so common in the deaf community. We'll be like, okay, um, yeah, um, this is the person that's the niece of that person, the blonde one that used to work with Joe at the thing. And that kind of shows our connection. So um, that is kind of how we um, identify with people. Can you go back to the other slide? I'm sorry. Okay. Last thing on this slide. So there's the deaf tendencies, the deaf bings that are um, what is common and acceptable in the deaf world. Um, but what's common and acceptable in the hearing world is very different. So we are not allowed to act like deaf people. That's not acceptable in the hearing world. So um, I'll be told, uh, we'll be told that um, certain things are not appropriate. So that's called code switching. Dinner table syndrome is a real thing um, that's commonly talked about in the deaf community. So if you grew up with a hearing family, if you're at the dinner table with all other hearing people, you don't understand anything. So you are used to being isolated and not being involved in those conversations. Um, kind of like water cooler chat at work or if you and your coworkers get together for lunch, that is another example of dinner table syndrome. Language deprivation, if you grew up having no access to any language, whether it be ASL or English, that can lead to a lot of delays. So if you don't have any language as you're growing up, that can have um, big consequences. Um, and then a lot of uh, hearing people give deaf people anxiety. So if it's a situation where we are not sure what it's gonna look like, we are often anxious about not understanding questions or not knowing what's going on. If there's an interpreter there and the interpreter doesn't understand what I'm going on, what I'm saying and what's going on, then I'm anxious about them not understanding me. So we have a lot of anxiety as deaf people in hearing environments. So now um, that was a little bit longer than we thought it was going to be, which is a deaf bing in itself. But um, we're going to now talk about the term deaf tax. The concept came from minority tax. Maybe you guys have heard of that before. It's basically um, a culture or a community that is not white or straight or um, mainstream have additional burdens, additional barriers that they have to navigate just to do their job that white cis hetero folks do not have to do. So deaf tax is a similar thing. We have to do a lot of extra work compared to our hearing peers. Deaf tax, for example, um, uh, a paper was written about the concept. So if you're uh, interested in learning a little bit more about that, then you can read this paper. Um, one of the things that we um, will talk about in terms of death tax, um, both here and, uh, excuse me, both here at U of R and at other places, we'll talk about different examples of it. So this comes down to who's making interpreter requests sometimes, and sometimes we will request an interpreter and they will say, oh, sorry, the interpreter is not available or we can't provide an interpreter. Luckily here at the University of Rochester at the hospital, we do have a centralized budget now that pays for interpreting services. So it's not solely on the department to provide the interpreting cost. And so it does make approvals for interpreting services a little bit easier, which is nice. Sometimes we will request an interpreter and then people will show us what the cost is over time and say, oh, this is really expensive. And you know, maybe you shouldn't really go to all these meetings because this wouldn't be that important for you and encourage you not to attend work meetings. Or sometimes there will be uh, an, an emotional cost to us when an interpreter is brought in, you know, making un unsure if the interpreter understands the content, if they understand us, if we've never worked with that interpreter before. And if I, often we have preferred interpreters who we know their style, but it is definitely extra work if we have to go through that extra explanation and get to know someone in that way. And sometimes we'll request an interpreter and someone will say, well, why, what do you need it for? And we have to justify that request. When an interpreter is requested, 
Um, often you need to do that ahead of time. So if someone asked me for a last minute meeting at one o'clock today, it, it feels very difficult to be able to get an interpreter for that. And, and so sometimes we'll have to ask, well, can we reschedule this for a later date solely for that reason? And, you know, just like uh, Eileen had mentioned before, water cooler talk or in the lunchroom or the break room, uh, it, it can be awkward having conversations that you have to do through text messaging instead of just chatting with each other like you do with your hearing peers. But those conversations are also so important for relationship building. And when those are missing, that has an impact. And so all of that is an extra burden on us as deaf employees. And sometimes we will have a variety of different interpreters assigned. We won't get a, a consistent interpreter for a meeting. And so maybe I will give a presentation and have one interpreter, and then the next time I give the same presentation, I have a different interpreter. And those interpreters may not know my content, may not know my signing style. And so I have to explain all of that background again. It's double the prep work because I've already done it once, but now I have to do it like I'm doing it for the first time again because I have new people. And have to make sure that I'm clear, if the interpreter needs clarification, that I'm paying attention to that as well. Um, we may also have CART services, which are captioning services that translate things into English, so that I'm able to read the transcript after. And sometimes I can look at that transcript and realize that the interpretation was quite off and that the interpreter did not let me know that they weren't understanding. And that is a really difficult situation because the things that I had expected to be interpreted in that scenario were not. And also interpreting styles are quite different. They are not all one and the same. And all of this adds up to extra burden on us as deaf employees. So how would an, an audience member, for example, would not know whether the misunderstanding or miscommunication came from me or from the interpreter and the interpreting process. It's important to recognize the emotional cost of this. So if there's a last minute meeting that has some important decision making being made, if I'm not able to attend because uh, the interpreters were not available at the last minute, I am not able to access that meeting. So my voice is not heard there. Um, <clears throat> a lot of businesses care more about money and don't want to pay for interpreters because they're feeling like they're losing revenue, which I understand, but at the same time, we are losing access. <clears throat> We've had experiences here and at other places as well that you need to prove you need an interpreter. So like I've been asked specifically, I needed to document every time I used an interpreter or not so that I could prove that I had enough data to deserve access at work. Compare that to uh, hearing coworkers who show up and immediately automatically without even thinking or doing anything additional already have access to their work environment. So justifying that tax. With different cultures comes prejudice um, and microaggressions. They are uh, closely tied. What underlies that experience is autism. Autism is a uh, type of discrimination that deaf folks experience. Autism, autism is the belief that if you are hearing or if you act like you are a hearing person, you are superior to those who act like deaf people. So sometimes microaggressions come from that belief. For example, I personally am able to talk and I sound, my voice sounds pretty close to a hearing person's voice. So hearing people like me because I use my voice. So they meet me and they're like, wow, you speak so well, wow. And it sounds nice, right? But I was born hearing, so I could pick up language uh, and auditory language and verbal language a little bit easier. It has nothing to do with my intelligence. It's not a reflection of that. Um, so it's just that kind of, again, microaggression of you speak really well and these other deaf people that don't talk don't, so they're probably not as smart. 
um, sometimes hearing people mean well and will say things like, oh my gosh, you're so lucky you're deaf. You don't have to hear this. Like if there's loud construction outside, like a jackhammer right outside the building, or um, if there was a cat meowing outside of your window all night and you couldn't sleep, you're like, oh my gosh, you're so lucky you're deaf. Sometimes deaf people take advantage of those things, but it comes with a lot of negatives to go along with those very rare moments of it is nice to not have to be able to hear those things. During meetings, often hearing people will be like curious about signs. So they'll watch the interpreter signing and then they'll hold up a meeting to be like, oh, interpreter, what did you sign for this? What did you sign for that? So taking up a meeting time with to replace it with an ASL lesson and also asking the hearing interpreters to teach them the deaf people's language instead of asking a deaf person. Um, again, microaggressions. A lot of times hearing coworkers will um, chat with the interpreters and make those connections with interpreters because they share a similar language. And I am left out of those conversations and I do not get to have those connections with coworkers. Deaf individuals in the workplace, um, people have lower expectations from deaf employees. If they can't speak English, they assume that their intelligence is lower as a result. Um, at school and at workplace, you'll see excuses made like, oh, don't worry about this. You don't have to go to this. Um, uh, this, is, th this doesn't apply to you. We'll commonly see that. Um, and that, again, is, again, coming from that autism, the belief that deaf people are inferior. If I am a deaf person and I follow my cultural norms, I am told that that is inappropriate. A lot of deaf people, deaf professionals, PhD level individuals here at U of R, several hearing people will say to them, you do not have the soft skills. You don't know how to talk with people appropriately. And we're like, okay, we talk with each other perfectly fine. Um, but they'll um, be like, well, you're a little bit more direct with your language and they will feel offended by that. And uh, I recently had a situation happen where we were talking about a policy of some kind and a deaf person sent an email to ask for more information saying, hey, can you share that policy with us? And the hearing person um, told our boss that we should be disciplined for asking that um, because it felt as though uh, they felt as though it undermined their authority just because we asked a question about a policy which again seemed appropriate in our culture because we were just asking that question but in hearing culture seemed inappropriate so these are struggles that we deal with So some of that of what we shared has happened in a social level, but it definitely extends into social and professional exclusion. And what Eileen just mentioned, and even in our um, time at this panel today, trying to encapsulate all the diversity that exists there, like we can see that there's a lot of barriers and challenges um, that we face that carry over into the workplace. And some it's sometimes we'll try to accommodate or fit um, the other hearing individuals communication preferences, but sometimes it's still a barrier. Like oftentimes when I sit down to a meeting and there's maybe a bunch of other hearing people there and everyone's having their conversation, but because I'm alone and the only person who signs, I'm left out. Or, you know, maybe there's even that thought that people don't want to sit close to me or next to me because I'm the one that signed. So like that experience can often be had among other deaf individuals. And oftentimes, you know, when we think about how conversation happens and like how conversation is even carried, you know, when working with an interpreter, there's sometimes that couple second delay. So to be able to like jump into a conversation is often harder than it is if you were just having that conversation directly. And the impacts of that is it could lead to more isolation or more of an unwillingness to want to contribute. And when we think about the just the numbers of within the community, like it's hard to be part of a smaller community sometimes and like trying to find 
ways to connect with people who share the same language. Um, we, as people who are visual communicators, like we all like contribute to each other and we can tell if someone's like tense or feeling awkward talking to us. And then that often becomes the burden for us to, to facilitate and communicate that back. Um, in also in the workplace with technology, with Zoom, sometimes we only see people's heads on Zoom. And when they're, you know, sharing, we only get to see just a little bit of their face or eyes. Um, and for deaf people, when we're on Zoom, we, we want to see almost their full body. You know, we, we want to be able to take in their facial expressions and their, their body language. And when meetings are had or facilitated on Zoom, um, and we're trying to find out who's talking and being able to um, just identify like their body language, it's hard for us to find you know, who's talking on Zoom too. One important thing is sometimes you learn the names that match the faces of your boss or your boss's boss or your boss's boss's boss or any of the administrators. Um, I uh, have to pin the interpreter so that uh, in big meetings when there's lots of videos on, I have to pin the interpreter so that they're bigger and I can see more clearly. Um, but then I don't see who is speaking and the interpreter sometimes can't catch it. Or um, even if I have a name of who's talking, I can't put the face to that name so I don't always know the names of the people that are above me because it's just that extra learning for me. I'd have to Google it and be like, okay, what does this person look like? But on Zoom, you naturally can just learn people's names and have it in speaker mode so that it comes up with their face when they're talking. So, you know, sort of like if you were picturing in, in a meeting, you can hear the, the differences in each person's voice. But if you're getting access only through an interpreter, you're only watching one interpreter to actually interpret for everyone else. And oftentimes the descriptors become man talking, woman talking, but this is what they're saying, but I still don't know who they're referring to. So just because like, if you have a large Zoom meeting and you only pin the interpreter, it's really hard to track with who's actually talking. Yeah, some meetings are very, very exhausting and my head will hurt after the meeting trying to scroll through all the boxes to see who is talking, try to keep up. And, you know, it's important to know if it's a peer talking or if it's someone above you in the hierarchy. And so trying to scroll through multiple screens and find that information um, and having features for interpreting. Sometimes we don't have multi-pin access for Zoom. So there might be a deaf person who's trying to participate in the meeting, but they aren't seen either by the interpreter or um, by other participants because it's just not easy to see all of the screens at once. And based on people's settings, it can be hard to catch that. Yeah, definitely. And we, we see that, and even just today, um, you know, when we think about how we're presenting, we just give you a couple seconds to read the slide. But typically, when presentations are given, people start talking right through the slideshow. And so even though um, that's considered normal, but when we're using interpreters, like we have to watch what's being said, plus try to read, we're splitting our attention to what's on the slide and what the interpreters are saying. And so that often becomes a barrier too. And the same goes for not having captions enabled. That is typically something that the burden falls back on deaf people to speak up when captions are not there. So we just want to take a few moments to talk about how we can create a safer space for those of us who are deaf in the work environment. I know time is running short. I do want to give you time to read the slides, but uh, when we ask for access for an interpreter to be brought into a situation, provide it instead of pushing back. Um, I think that often, like in therapy appointments, we're limited to 45 minutes, and often sometimes those need to be extended to 60 minutes because there is so much background information that has to be shared. And sometimes um, higher ups will say that we can't give you extra time, but there is extra time needed sometimes when you're working in another language. Um, you could offer to take the burden off of us and request interpreters for situations that need them. 
check in with the deaf person to make sure that there was understanding that there weren't misunderstandings that happened communication is a two way street so that's important to remember. And access should be guaranteed budget should not be an excuse not to provide accommodations. And um, help advocate for interpreting needs and for the deaf employees needs. I'm sure everyone is aware that you have biases, everyone does, but make sure that you check that bias. Um, what you think professional behavior looks like, where that standard comes from, does that allow for cultural diversity in the workplace? And if you feel sometimes you're like, wow, a deaf person is doing something that feels rude, check in with them too and sit down with them and, and ask, you know, where are you coming from with that? And it could just be a cultural behavior. Um, as Donna mentioned, clinical policies, check to see if the clinical policies actually meet the needs of a population. Um, Donna mentioned our department has been so great about allowing us extra time to work with our patients instead of the uh, normal 45 minutes, because in order to meet their needs and in order to, um, you know, have productive appointments with our patients, we need longer time and then who is punished in the end is me because I haven't met all of those needs in such a short amount of time. Learn what is culturally appropriate, the term like hearing impaired and other terms like that. Take some time to learn how to say deaf and hard of hearing. What are the politically correct terms? Also be open-minded to feedback as well because deaf people will give you feedback <laughs> because again, we are blunt people. So be willing to accept that feedback when it's given. We're not going to show you this video right now just to um, in the essence of time, but we did just hire a new individual in a leadership role here at the University of Rochester. Uh, he is the director of deaf equity and accessibility. Um, that is what he looks like. <laughs> um, he is here. He just started this week. Um, if your department wants any more training or needs anything, um, you can contact him. Um, if you have a conflict with a deaf employee that you want to resolve, he would be a great contact person to um, be able to help with that. His name is Chris Campbell. So on this slide, I think some takeaways for all of us and just great opportunities for us to practice. Like I think uh, learning sign language is goes such a long way that intentionality of showing uh, a basic willingness to learn sign language and then approach your deaf colleagues like join the deaf table. You know, I think as a group, we're so welcoming, like there's different technologies that we can use to even carry a conversation without an interpreter, but just that willingness that attitude goes a long way. And then if there's no interpreter, don't let that be a barrier as well. We'll find other ways to communicate and connect. You know, as someone who um, doesn't depend on lip reading, I would prefer texting back and forth, but we can find a variety of methods to help carry that conversation. And it's so important to make sure that the information, things presented um, are accessible. So let your audience have time to take in that information, um, especially when working with an interpreter too. Like, and it benefits hearing people as well. You know, people who prefer to process information visually too, having a few second pause to take in that information or making sure it's accessible goes a long way. And then when we're working with an interpreter, like don't assume that just because there, there's an interpreter um, that everything's going to be fine. Check in with the deaf person themselves. Make sure like if they're presenting something, then um, checking for understanding, making sure you're aware of the pace and how everyone is participating, especially in conversation or group discussions. And then lastly, like hosting events that are visually acceptable and open are accessible to deaf and hard of hearing people to promote those connections among your team goes a long way. We could go on and on and on in our deaf standard time, but we appreciate that you guys are still here. I know that we are over time. Um, 
but we will be here to answer any questions that you have um, for those of you that are still with us. Well, thank you. Let's those of us that are still here, a round of applause for our guest speakers today and those that are still online. We're close to 100 still online. It was advertised till 1.30 today. So, um, and I know we've lost a few, but we will proceed. A question has come in and it is, let's see, what is the best way to communicate with deaf people if there is no interpreter and you want to have small talk with them? Best practice, obviously, is to ask the person what their preferred method of communication is. But my suggestion would be for you to take some action yourself. So if you have an app on your phone that you can do voice to text on, that's a good approach. You can just show it to the deaf person and see, ask if this is an OK way to communicate for them. Yeah, that's a that's a great uh, technology tool. We can um, there's also, you know, some apps that I think that are coming out that can go text to sign language too, but some of them um, are also there that you can download or even apps that help you learn sign language. Just showing uh, some willingness to use sign language goes a long way. Like it was mentioned, um, writing back and forth. The speech to text is obviously a lot faster, but texting can be a great way. Sometimes if you're in person and it's really important, you can't write back and forth, I'll say, well, just call me and I can use my video phone and I can use a um, video relay interpreter um, if there's not an interpreter available in the hospital. And for maybe some of you, it, there's um, what we call video relay service, which is uh, basically interpreters for phone calls. So you could just call my number, the number that I would give out, and that automatically connects with an interpreter to me. And that's a great tool that we can use. Thank you. Um, another question, can you recommend anything within the community to improve your sign language skills? I do know that Rochester School for the Deaf offers some classes. Uh, there are a lot of different apps and things on the internet that you can look up um, and then practice yourself at home. Really, I would recommend if you're using an app, try to find a deaf person who you're comfortable with, who you can um, maybe practice with, who can maybe teach you. That would be better than using a hearing person. I think Linguvano is another app. Um... Uh, there's there's several, but I can't remember the names, but Ling Vano is one that comes to mind. Also in the community, like I mentioned, I learned sign language when I was 20. And so I did feel like I had to learn an entire other language. And so you can go to a college and take college classes just like you would any other language. And then I would recommend going to deaf events, really getting involved in the deaf community, keep in mind that this is an entire language, so we wouldn't expect that from an app, all of a sudden you would be fluent and signing to us. <laughs> but you know, if you're able to learn a few signs and that will help us have some basic communication, I think that's great. Thank you. Our next question. I served on a state board that met hybrid on Zoom, but they refused to enable closed captions. When I insisted on getting closed captions over a six month period, the director fired me from the board. Wow, I'm so sorry that that happened. It does happen to deaf people all over the country and it's an awful experience and you have a right to receive accommodations for you to do your work. Yeah, that's devastating, especially the loss of a position or work in that that situation yeah to piggyback off of that question are there legal entities that would help someone in that type of a situation so you know americans with disabilities act you can contact the National Association of the Deaf, NAD. They do have some legal advocates there. And I believe the first consultation is free, so you could check in with them to see if they think you have a good case. If your workplace 
uh, may provide some legal services. I think there are policies against discrimination and harassment here. So uh, you may be able to go down that route. Uh, but I think NAD is the only outside organization that I can think of. I think there is an employment one also. The EEOC is another one. You know, I know that there are some lawyers who specialize with accessibility related issues in the EEOC too. Kelby Brick. I think Kel there is a deaf lawyer named Kelby Brick, but I'm not sure what specific area of practice he works in. But there are some resources, but those were the ones that we know off the top of our head right now. Thank you. Are there any other questions in the room? If so, and if you need the sign language, we do have Amanda. Okay, Gilbert, go right ahead. You had, you had a bullet point on one of your slides that I don't think you got to, or I missed it. And it was the deaf goodbye. Since we're almost wrapping up, could you say what you were going to do for that one? The deaf goodbye is basically a very extended goodbye when we try to leave somewhere. So instead of just being like, hey, see you later, uh, we start saying goodbye maybe an hour or two before we actually plan to leave <laughs> because inevitably a story will come up. Oh my gosh, do you, do you know what happened? And then you have to fill someone in. And so uh, it's very, <laughs> being Latina, I have uh, double that because it's already in the Latina culture and then as well in the deaf culture. And also I think I would say too, like the amount of, opportunities we have to connect and see each other again like is you know so common for deaf people like we don't always know when the next time will be so it feels like we're trying to capture every single moment in our goodbyes so when i was learning sign language i would go to a deaf event um, maybe at starbucks they often would host events and starbucks closes at nine o'clock and so they would actually have to kick us out because we would still be standing there talking and talking. They would try to turn the lights down and eventually they just have to turn the lights off and be like, get out. And then we would just stand in the parking lot and talk and be like, hey, look, there's a bar over there. Maybe we should just go over there and talk and uh, then stay there till they close and get kicked out <laughs> before we actually go home. Yeah, and even you think of, um, we we would often be in a restaurant and all the employees would start leaving except for the manager or something, we'd be the last ones to leave. Uh, we are typically the last ones to leave an event for sure. Thank you. Any other questions in the auditorium? If so, raise your hand or Amanda has the iPad if you need to sign. All right, it looks like nothing online and all of the questions have been answered in person as well. So on that note, it looks like we get out a little bit early unless you want to start your goodbyes now and we could still end at 1.30. <laughs> we probably should. It's all kidding aside, one thing to uh, end with, for those that showed up in person, thank you. We always appreciate that. I know when we had the option to be on Zoom only, we actually were hesitant because we enjoy the face-to-face -face interaction. So thank you for being here. And I know not everyone could be here, so nothing bad to those that participated on Zoom. Thank you for being there as well. But it's great to see friendly faces in the room too. I agree. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you all and thank everyone in person and online. Let's give her another round of applause. Thank you everyone. Have a good afternoon.